wins or not. Presented by Still a Frog. Mom, how did you learn how to tie a tie like this? Are you kidding? It's a skill I was born with, she laughed. He was getting so handsome, so big. She could hardly believe that this gangly, skinny-kneed, inquisitive, and occasionally precocious nine-year-old had come from her. And yet she remembered it all too well. Her hand grazed her stomach as she recalled that morning in the hospital. 5 a.m., an early riser right from the start, premature on top of it, coming in at a whopping five pounds, two ounces. Sean just stood in a daze, watching the whole thing unfold. The nurses and doctor frantically cleaning the child off. More doctors rushing in, machines and monitors. The baby is blue, they kept saying, or at least that's what she'd heard. It was a whirlwind of medicine and modern miracles. She was just there, squarely in the center of it all. The mother, exposed, half-draped, vulnerable and exhausted, but a mother nevertheless. Stoic. She remained stoic. She had to. There was no other choice in that moment. Her child needed her. There was no more room to cry or rant and rave. There was only room to soldier on and pray. Sean, on the other hand, had practically collapsed into himself. Her purpose there in that delivery room was clearly defined. His was not. Without certainty to cling to, Sean generally panicked. Not exactly a fly-by-the-seat-of-his-pants kind of guy. She liked his regimentedness. She depended on it, especially during critical life moments. But not then. Not during that critical life moment. She transformed herself into the harbor, trying to shield them all from the storm. Nicholas was in the hospital for three weeks, the longest three weeks of their lives, an avalanche of problems, many of them potentially life-threatening. She remembered that time as clearly as if it were a movie playing before her eyes, and yet it was also a sequence of events that she'd blocked out until they brought their little boy home to join his toddling sister, a family of four. They were complete. Did Dad wear ties a lot? He asked, smiling up at her with that smile that was undeniably a hand-me-down of Sean's. Your dad didn't exactly like to wear ties. Let's put it that way, she snickered. How come? Well, he said they were too constricting, she explained. Constricting, what does that mean? It means he felt they were too tight on his neck, like he couldn't breathe. She ruffled his sandy blonde hair. That he'd gotten from her. Pretty much everything else, though, was his father. And that was the killer. Every morning, watching Nicholas eat his cereal the way he did, or when he brushed his teeth and then swished the mouthwash around exactly three times before spitting and rinsing, or how when he watched TV, he sat with his head resting on the crook of his outstretched elbow. Sean, right there, in front of her. So much in front of her, she could practically breathe him in. Sometimes this destroyed her, and sometimes it was a lifeline she didn't know she needed until it appeared. Sean worked at the Library of Congress. Initially, he gave tours and went around warning people not to touch stuff. She likened his job to that of one of those taciturn Catholic school nuns who'd wrapped students on the knuckles with a ruler when they were being naughty. Eventually, he rose up the ranks and ascended to Division Staff Chief. There was more prestige in the title than there was money, and living in a city like D.C. was not exactly an inexpensive endeavor. But somehow, they managed. That's where they'd met, the Library of Congress. She was doing research for an article. She'd noticed him keeping a watchful eye on some punk-looking kids who more than likely had not come there to study or read quietly per the numerous signs posted throughout Inwardly, she laughed at his way-too-serious library cop demeanor. He was cute, though, she thought. Needing to stretch her legs, she wandered around, making her way over to a vault-like door. She couldn't help herself. She entered. It was a walk-in card catalog, illuminated by flickering fluorescent lights complete with ominous humming sound. There was no one else in this catacomb-like maze of tiny alphabetically labeled drawers. This would make for the perfect horror film, she thought. Carnage in the card catalog, or Nightmare in the Library of Congress, or how about I Know What You Read Last Summer? Okay, she was definitely getting tired and a little bit punchy, which is why when he came up behind her, she screamed loudly, What the hell? 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry, he said, then resuming his official posture. He rather sternly informed, ma'am, you are not supposed to be in this area of the library. Oh, I I didn't realize. I mean, I was just, I, I apologize. I, he broke then, a sly smile forming, his poker face effectively dissolved. I'm just kidding, he chuckled. So, wait, I can be in here, she asked. Of course. Only the areas with no admittance postings are off-limits to the general public. She wasn't sure whether to smack him, storm off, or laugh along with him. Very funny, she hissed. So you're interested in bovine insemination, he said, gesturing toward the little drawer on which she currently had her hand. Why, yes, I am. My poor cow Elsie just can't seem to get knocked up. They laughed. The laughter continued at the coffee shop down the street. They were still laughing that night at a tapas place in DuPont Circle. They laughed the next morning, laying in her bed, when she explained repeatedly that, no, she never did this, no, she was not a slut, and yes, she genuinely liked him, otherwise she wouldn't have asked him up. They were married a year and a half later. All Sean ever wanted was a family. All she ever wanted was a family. Thank God they were on the same page. Mariah came about 11 months later, followed by Nicholas, tiny little Nicholas. Now not so tiny anymore, standing in front of the mirror, adjusting his big boy tie. What's this knot called, Mom? It's called a Windsor knot, she said. Okay, Windsor knot, he repeated to his reflection. Was this Dad's favorite tie, he then asked. It was the one he wore at our wedding. They'd gotten married at this small little chapel in Georgetown, Just them, them and the reverend, and his hard-of-hearing wife, who'd served as their witness. They wanted to avoid the big wedding and the big gowns and the big price tag that went along with all of it. No, they opted for love over lavishness. A moment, a private celebration, an easily replayed memory they could rely on to shepherd them through those tenser and inevitable breakdowns in the wife-husband model of living. She loved their wedding. She loved the simplicity of a day devoted to love for love's sake. She loved his tie. Mom? Yes, honey. Whose fault was it that dad's gone? It was nobody's fault, she said, now tearful. It was an accident, a terrible, horrible accident. Oh, he said reflectively. Do you miss dad? Every single day of my life. The day before the accident, they were lying in bed, the kids still asleep, the house uncharacteristically quiet for a Sunday morning. This is perfection, Sean had whispered, afraid of disenchanting the spell of silence. It certainly is. How much longer does it last? How much longer before a dog barks or a kid whines about something? He grinned. I give it 20 minutes, she replied. An hour, he said. It's a bet. Loser walks Ripley every day for the next month. Deal, he held out his hand. They shook on it. Sure enough, about 15 minutes later, Mariah. Mom, Nick just came in my room without knocking. Can you please tell him to get out? Double or nothing, Sean winked. Double or nothing, she said. Uh-huh.